Madam President and your cabinet, members of the union, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. I was invited by the union to share my experiences about what they called the perennial uh, a perennial opposition uh, to the government in Uganda. And uh, that's what I'm here to do. Uh, it is true that uh, I have been in the opposition of the powers that be in Uganda for quite a long time. Certainly in the last 20 years, during <coughs> the tenure of the current president, Mr. Museveni, who has been in power now for more than 33 years. And for that 20 years of opposition, I have obviously attracted quite a lot of hostility to myself and to those in a similar situation like I am. I am right now out on bail on very many of you know, charges in various courts in Uganda, including treason. Uh, I have previously been charged with treason again. This is the second time I'm being charged with treason. I've been charged with terrorism, been charged with illegal possession of guns, with rape, and uh, all kinds of manner of offenses. I've been shot and injured. I've been uh, forced out of the country and lived in exile. And uh, my brother has died in this process. We were together in prison at some stage. And so, yes, uh, being in perennial opposition of uh, a regime like I have been has a huge cost. But I have not been just in opposition to the Museveni regime. I actually did not take off to be a political actor. I studied medicine and I wanted to be a medical doctor. But during the study, during my course in the university, it was a very difficult time of Idi Amin, where there was gross abuses of human rights and impunity. And I was a victim of that during those days. So post Idi Amin, we were quite euphoric that things were going to turn around. And indeed, having gained some conscientization politically during the Amin period, I was a keen follower of the politics post Idi Amin. And I quickly associated with one of the new formations that emerged at that period, a political party that was started in my presence and led by the current leader. President Museveni. But the contestation for office in that election of 1980 was extremely rough, being uh, moderated largely by the force of arms. And indeed, it was during the campaigns of that uh, election that Mr. Museveni indicated that if the ruling junta then, it was a military commission which was governing, that if it went ahead and rigged elections, he would go to war. And he lived up to his promise and went to war in 1981. Those of us who had supported him were in trouble. I was arrested in 1981 and nearly died in prison. And indeed, many of the people I was with in prison have never been seen again. I was lucky to escape. I went into exile in Kenya, but an annoyed person determined that I will not die needlessly like I was about to, 
that I should fight to change that, to end that kind of impunity and abuse of rights. And so I practiced a bit of medicine in Kenya as an exilee before joining the Bush War in 1982. <coughs> and uh, the Bush War was, is another story I can't go into now. Happy Late ended in 1986 successfully, leaving more than half a million people dead. And we came into government, that's when Mr. Museveni became president. And he made a famous speech at the doors of parliament when he was being sworn in, saying that what was happening then was a fundamental change and not a mere change of guards. Now, I'll come back to that statement. I was then appointed into government in 1908 as a minister. And I stayed, I worked as a government minister until 1990. We are supposed to organize a transition to a democratic dispensation having won the war. And the transition period we had declared would be four years. We disagreed on how that transition would be managed. And the transition period didn't end until 10 years later and end in courts. So having disagreed, I was dismissed from government in 1990, the end of our original transitional period. And uh, because I had become a soldier, I was conscripted to continue in the forces. And I commanded some units of our military until eventually I fought to be released and was finally released in 1999 when the current phase of my opposition started now outside, completely outside, outside government. But what I want to focus on is not so much myself in these remarks that I am making. It is on the nature of the state that has created what I'm talking about. Because uh, quite often I think there is some bit of a misunderstanding and that's why even terms like opposition figure, opposition leader are used. Because opposition means that there is government party and there is opposition party. And I would like to suggest that that is misnomerous in our situation. Our situation needs to be viewed with two elements in mind. The first one is that what we are talking about are really artificial nations that were created by coercive power. There were originally different nations within the current nations that were destroyed by force of guns and new nations artificially created by force. And of course you are familiar with that creation uh, after the Berlin conference and whatever. And these new nations destroyed our citizenship. We, we ceased being citizens we became subjects of the new force that took over power. The force of guns that took over power was the sovereign. We were subjects. And uh, that means that we lost all power of citizenship. We had no control of our wealth, of our resources. We had no control over decision making. We had no control over execution of whatever decisions or policies are made and we had no control over adjudication. Those with guns had total control of all that. And of course at that time it was the British government and we were subjects of the Queen. Now of course, there was an internal struggle all over the territories that were controlled by the British Empire then. I think 
the misfortune that some of our nations have is that the struggle to regain citizenship did not mature. That we built enough internal capacity to dispose the guns that had taken over our power. I think what happened was that because of the different struggles that we are, that the British Empire was facing, it was decided that there should be negotiated independence for some of the territories where our countries fall. There was negotiated independence before our internal dynamics could afford us the ability to assert our will. What happened, therefore, is that we came from the artificial countries led by the sovereign, a real sovereign, to an artificial country led by an artificial sovereign. Because here were now ordinary peasants, some who had qualified to become teachers, to become trade union leaders, being given the power and the guns that control it, and having all power unto themselves when they did not have the, uh, the infrastructure, the experience, whatever goes with having that power. So power did not shift from the colonial administration to the people of Uganda. It shifted from the colonial administration to some new kings, some new uh, sovereigns that were now in control of their forces that were left behind. And this is why, in fact, I think in many of the, of the uh, independent African countries, there has been even times when people reminisce favorably to the colonial era because there was some semblance of <laughs> more order and, uh, uh, and uh, development than there has been under the independent states. And uh, so citizenship has not been reclaimed in many of these countries. Power still resides with those with guns that succeeded the ones that formed the states. That's why in a country like Uganda, no leader has ever handed over power peacefully to another. Every leader has been bombed out of office. And whoever has come into office has bombed his way into office. So citizens, are, or would be citizens, are irrelevant in these processes. They do not espouse leadership, they do not determine how the country will be managed and so on and so forth. It is the gunmen. And of course, in the intervening period because of the international systems and demands, there has been a tendency to organize elections. Not so that citizens may participate and determine what happens in these countries, but to justify themselves. And uh, <coughs> Uh, so you, we, we, we have elections that are totally fraud. You know, it's just a facade. Uh, and not surprisingly, even as you may have heard very recently, we had governments that had been overwhelmingly elected only recently, uh, General Bashir had been elected with 94% of the vote. Robert Mugabe was re-elected with 61% of the vote. Bouteflika was re-elected with 81% of the vote. Only for a short while later, the country is to explode, uh, demanding that those systems end. So the elections that we go through in which I have participated four times as a presidential candidate, are elections that I participate in 
well aware that at the end of the election, I'm not going to be announced as a winner. And should some miracle happen that I am announced, that I will not be expecting General Museveni to come and hand over power to me and retreat uh, to his village. So what then is our engagement? So our engagement um, is really in simple terms a struggle. Having not been in politics previously, I actually did not understand the dynamics of all these processes. I have come to confront them in reality as uh, the situation has been swinging me around. When I went to the war, I thought that there were those who had bad guns that were being used against our people and that we could get good guns to depose the bad guns and do the needful hand over power to the people. As it turned out, and I learned the hard way, which is what I was saying, you know, that Mr. Museven had said there was not a ch mere change of guards, that there was a fundamental change. The reality is that if you take up guns and fight other guns, there can only be a mere change of the guards. There are no, because in fact the war weakens the society even more and renders the society much less able to demand accountability of the new warlords. It makes their situation even more uh, disastrous than it was before the war that we went through. So what we have been uh, suggesting to our people and what is ongoing now is that there must be a struggle that a vote on its own, organized by the military junta, however clothed, will not lead to citizens regaining their citizenship, or Ugandans or whoever they are, regaining their citizenship. That these people who lost their citizenship, who have no control over their wealth, who have no control over decision making, who have no control over adjudication and so on, that they will not regain those until they struggle. And so there are three processes that we've been going through. One is the conscientization, the awakening, the reawakening of people to know that this is, first of all, their land, they, they have right there, they don't live there by permission of anybody, and that they can assert their right to regain confidence, to regain faith in themselves. That is one of the most difficult processes that one can go through when people have been dominated for so long. Fear is one of the biggest problems to deal with, to dispel in these people, because they have been living in fear for over 100 years. In fact, fear has become cultural. It is within our sayings. We glorify cowardice. There are words in our language which say, in the home of the cowards, they are laughing. In the home of the brave, they are crying. So the uh, lesson, it's okay to be a coward. So even if I step on you, just remain calm and hope that one time I will go away. And, and there the, the are sayings like, you know, it's better to uh, to be humiliated than to die. That is the, 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 those are the sayings that you grow up hearing. It's better to be humiliated than to die. So even if you are humiliated, be uh, happy that you are still alive and one day the humiliation somehow will go away. We have to change this. And I've quite often been questioned, if you know that Frankly, the election is not going to cause change in itself. Why do you go? And the reason indeed we go is because it's a unique opportunity to reach the ordinary people. 
it's not easy on any other day, save for those days that have been set aside for this uh, scene for the international community to realize that there is an election going on and cameras to come and capture scenes of uh, rallies. On any other day, it is extremely difficult. Just before I came, before I flew out here, we had a meeting at our party headquarters and I could not leave because it had been barricaded off by the time the meeting ended. Happily, we have learned survival mechanisms as the forces were still intensifying outside our gate. I found a way out and I waved at them as I ran. <laughs> 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 but that is, I have been pulled out of radio stations just to talk, give a talk. Uh, because if you cannot reach them physically, at least because they brought harsh rules for organizing a public meeting. We have a law called the Public Order Management Act, which says if you want to organize three or more people to talk about politics, you need the authority, the permission of the Inspector General of Police. Not just any other policeman, but the Inspector General of Police. But to ridicule that, even now, talking from the radio station cannot be tolerated, so they can put you out of the radio station. So elections, when they organize them for that, for, the, for their purposes, they offer us a unique opportunity to conscientize our people, to interact with our population and wake them up and strengthen them and give them confidence. And of course, faith is the biggest counter to fear. The more faith you have, the less fear you have. So we build faith in them and they become less fearful. Secondly, is to give them organizational competencies that they can pull and act together and speak together. Building leadership networks amongst them. And again, doing this in a manner that will be uh, undetected because uh, if you have known leaders, they are attacked, they are isolated, they are traumatized. So we create leadership networks that are not known. Now, once people are aware, awake, once they are organized, regaining their power is the easiest thing. And we believe that as has happened elsewhere, indeed, that is the way to go for communities like ours to regain power by taking actions that will nullify, that will uh, make the force of arms uh, uh, incapable of, 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 of controlling uh, the power of our people. Because you can imagine, you know, a country like Uganda is a rural country, largely. You know, 80% of the people live in the villages, if they chose and they organized, if they chose to say from tomorrow, we are not going to send food to the market. In a week, the soldiers themselves will run after their leader because there will be, the prices would have gone up maybe 10, 20, 40. And the, you know, peasants can. And once they realize their power through their networking, and it happens in incrementally through struggling in small, fights over small things and they realize they can achieve something. And this is what we've been building, you know. Some roads are very neglected. Pe peasants wake up and say, nobody will pass through this road unless it is repaired and they close it. And, and in one week, they, they are busy trying to repair it. And now they know things can happen by their own effort. And so this is uh, what we think will eventually cause the actual break, the actual fundamental change that power will shift from those with guns to those without. That guns will be, for the first time, subordinated to our people. Now, once that happens, there is obviously a very uh, tough job to do to now rebuild the society into a democratic one. The major ingredient would have been achieved, the conscientization, the awakening of the people. 
but you are talking about a transition where the entire economy is in the hands of a few and people are totally marginalized. How do they, and part of the anger of causing the change is that marginalization. How do they, how do you reorganize so that you can have working public service, uh, you know, that health, education, and so on can once again be uh, available to ordinary people. These are questions that uh, must be grappled with ahead of any such change. The institutions that um, ought to be built uh, in a new constitutional framework need to be engaged with. Uh, the security, how will security be managed and so on. And uh, eventually also the now conscious building of a nation because we are different nationalities forced to live together. So we must have a process of uh, deliberately uh, interacting, having a dialogue and agreeing on mechanisms of how we consciously and willfully live together as a community. So there must be a process and especially after the trauma that we have gone through, you know, the, 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 the uh, violence and uh, killings and so on must have a truth-telling, justice and reconciliation process that uh, uh, then integrates the country and then we can have free and fair elections ending that kind of a transition. So this is how I have been trapped in uh, becoming a perennial opposition <laughs> person. I joined these processes without much consideration. When I was 24 years, I'm now 63. And uh, every day the burden on me to continue increases because of the many sacrifices that I see our colleagues that have made, ha have made whom if we didn't continue, those sacrifices would be in vain, including indeed many who have died. Uh, sometimes people sympathize with us who are alive, but there are those who have, you know, paid the ultimate sacrifice. So, with these few words, I am glad to be here once again, and I think I'll sit down and I can uh, hear what uh, uh, your own views and questions on these issues are. Thank you very much. Dr. Bazigia, thank you very much for being here today and thank you for the, the steps that you took to get here. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about the nature of the relationship between you and President Museveni. Some people have made allegations that it's actually a personal feud between the two of you that has manifested in these highly contested elections. What would you say to those people and, and to those allegations? Well, first of all, propaganda is one of the constant features that we have to grapple with in this kind of a struggle. Trying to paint those who oppose the regime in the darkest uh, kinds of colors possible and to whitewash the regime. And all regimes of this nature, regimes controlled by a few people, if you a few people control the largest majority of people, that's one of the constant approaches. They spend hugely on propaganda. But it's not borne out by any kind of evidence because part of that uh, propaganda was actually based and even run uh, on some forte kind of uh, uh, history that my wife had with uh, General Museveni, because both of us were in the, in the revolution that went wrong. And there was, you know, speculation that my wife had a relationship with Museveni and that that's what we are feuding over, quite obviously wrong. And uh, uh, 
as I've said, not borne out by the facts because many other people have left Museveni to do what I have been doing. They have not been treated in any different way from the way I have been treated. Very recently, in the last election, his immediate former prime minister, the Honorable Amama Ambabazi, uh, deferred, disagreed with him and became a candidate in that election. And he was treated horribly, just like we have been treated. Before that, his closest childhood friend, a gentleman called Elia Kategaya, had uh, opposed the lifting of term limits, which was done earlier. This time they, they lifted the age limit, but prior to that, in 2005, they lifted the age, li the, the term limits. We had in our constitution a two term limit for presidency. So they lifted it. His childhood friend, who was also deputy prime minister, who had been minister of foreign affairs and so on, opposed that. He was promptly sacked and uh, ostracized and all kinds of similar things told about him, terrible stories that were told about him. So anybody who challenges the power meets the greatest wrath. Very lately, some young gentleman from the music world called Bobby Wine, who is now a member of parliament, you know, until two years ago, he had nothing to do with politics. He only stood in a by-election to, to go to parliament. But uh, uh, quickly gained a lot of following within the young people. He, he too is charged, he, he was charged with the illegal possession of guns. He's been uh, uh, tortured beyond belief and so on and so forth. So it has nothing to do with anything personal. It is definitely vicious protection of the of the power. And this is why I was saying, you know, that it is better to live under patrimonial regime that has naturally evolved. Because it evolves with the checks and balances, it evolves with the institutions that manage power. The trouble is that, you know, all these people are just peasants who have now become kings. And so they will do anything and everything not to lose this kind of benefit. <laughs> Especially when the competence is within the population to challenge and to uh, limit their power are not there at all. This is, the, this is the problem that we are facing. So you touched upon it then, but something you've said is a real problem in Uganda and in East Africa at large is the domination of society by a few small cliques. Yeah. How, if you were to be elected and to, to come into power, would you combat this more structural issue uh, and avoid the same fate as Museveni was so, getting in and, so, and saying that he was going to. And then. Yes, so that's why our primary focus is on conscientizing of people, empowering people with knowledge and information so that, and, and organizational competencies so that they can demand accountability. The changes within the leadership must be driven by the population, not depend on the, uh, you know, the goodwill of the leader to behave well or not to behave well. There must be inherent uh, uh, processes and uh, mechanisms that will, you know, ensure that a leader acts in a particular way, in an accountable way. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it is also important, and that's why indeed there are campaigns, that people's track record is also assessed before they are given uh, an opportunity to exercise power. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody has been a bully right from you know childhood and has never behaved in any accountable way at all, then it would be, and these are all campaign issues, then it would be dangerous to elect such a person. But over and above all that, I think there must be 
competencies within the governed to control those who are in leadership. And that is the biggest lacking area that we are trying to, uh, to overcome, to empower citizens. Uh, and you know, once it is achieved, once through this struggle, they achieve, they know that they can subordinate those with guns. Oh, nobody will ever uh, become, you know, uh, a dictator again. You know, I, I sometimes indeed inform our people that uh, it's not our tradition, even when somebody has been exposed as corrupt and every, all evidence is there for them to say, I now resign as opposed to what happens uh, in democratic societies. You know, if you have been exposed, you don't wait to be pushed. You, because you know that that for sure is, will, is going to follow. So you, you do the necessary thing and you resign. In our case, they don't resign because they know that there are no competencies within the communities to actually push them. You know, there is a, a, a very uh, uh, recent case I'm not even aware of any other. There is a Chinese gentleman called Patrick Ho, who has been tried and sentenced in the United States by a federal court for bribing President Museveni. He was tried, all evidence laid out in an open court. He was convicted. He has been sentenced to three years in jail for bribing Museveni and his Minister of Foreign Affairs. But in Uganda, it's not even that seriously talked about. <laughs> in spite of, you know, of very glaring, not only was the money given, but they are all including films and so on, having you know, delivered uh, the bribe, showing him the oil fields uh, that uh, <laughs> that he could uh, access, you know, and all these things, which, which is horrific, you know, because it simply means that somebody is in office selling the country. But, you know, it's not a big deal. And let me tell you, part of that is what I was talking about, the culture. The culture of exclusion, people being excluded, means they actually treat government as a foreign entity, mm -hmm. because it was indeed a British government. Whoever steals from them and brings to them is a hero. Whoever steals from the government is a hero because the government is not theirs. And, and so even these ministers and so on, when they steal, they, they go to the villages and donate to churches, donate to uh, you know, village uh, charitable causes, and they are praised even when they know that the money that is coming was actually stolen from, from government. So this is the whole mindset that must change for people to now consider that government is their government. Mm -hmm. The resources are their resources. Their suffering is because those resources are not relating to their problems. And the, that's where the biggest work that we have, if we have to create change that lasts, that's where it is. And you've talked about the disconnect between the politicians and the people, and that can be seen with women in Ugandan parliament, who there's a higher percentage of women in Ugandan parliament than in the UK, and yet when women come to vote at the polls, they're intimidated, there's violence used against them. Why, you've talked about why the disparity exists, but what can we do, what can Ugandans do to bridge that gap between politicians and people? Unfortunately, it's the painstaking effort of transferring information and getting people to be differently aware, mm -hmm. conscious. You know, because even when you talk about women uh, in politics in Uganda, we have affirmative action seats, mm -hmm. you know, and which raise the numbers of women in elected District. positions, because every district of Uganda has to elect a woman member of parliament and we now have 100 and near 150 districts. So, and then they are free to contest all the other constituencies with men. 
But what has that done? First of all, it has created these women seats as some kind of a ghetto. Uh, you know, when a woman tries to stand in other city, they say, no, 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 you, you don't come here. You, you, have, you have your seats. <laughs> and, um, and these seats now, the women who uh, use them to be elected, of course, they become empowered by earning highly, you know, members of parliament are the, the, some of the most highly paid uh, employees in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I get about $10,000 uh, a month. Uh, when a teacher, a secondary school teacher, gets about $200 and so on. Uh, so, but these women, once they go and become empowered and they drive big vehicles and they have money, they make sure that that affirmative action seat is theirs forever. <laughs> so it's no longer affirmative action, it's just, <laughs> we, we have the Speaker of Parliament of Uganda. She has, be, before she was a speaker, she was deputy speaker for 10 years. She is now speaker in the second term. She was a speaker for five years, this is the second term. Before she became deputy speaker, she was a minister in the government. She's a, a distinguished lawyer in her own right. She's still on affirmative action seat. <laughs> she cannot contest on the ordinary seat. So uh, unless the population down there, you know, has the competence uh, to, to, to challenge this, uh, people will continue to take advantage, mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of them. And your question was, how would I ensure? You know, you can't tell, you know, by the looks of people what they will do. I, you know, wholly believe that Mr. Museveni meant what he said, you know, uh, until I saw him mutate into some different creature. So. The guarantor must be in the competencies of our people. And touching on some of his policies, Mr. Museveni's policies, in 2014 he signed a bill uh, which basically meant that repeat homosexuals could be um, jailed for life. You were highly critical of this uh, and you were the, one of the only voices not from the um, LGBTQ community to be critical of that. Do you think that harmed your chances within your own country in the 2016 election? No, I don't think so. Though, of course, uh, again, the propaganda, you know, is raved to try and, you know, depict you as uh, wanting to uh, get children to be, uh, you know, used for homosexual acts and so on and so forth, which is ridiculous because whether it's for homosexual or heterosexual acts, children are protected, she must be protected. And if anybody, you know, <laughs> engages with them, is, it's already a capital offense, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is punishable. But again, you know, you are dealing with sentiments, you are dealing with uh, uh, people that don't have all the information. And so propaganda, yes, is used, but to my knowledge, I don't think that that, because, you know, um, frankly, we have been defeating Mr. Museveni. In the last election, we still have uh, all the evidence mm. to show that we defeated him. And that's why we set up what is called the people's government. Uh, but, you know, I was jailed even before the results were announced. And in, in our constitution, it's only a candidate that can petition against the results. <laughs> Even if you are a party candidate, the party cannot petition. It has to be you personally to petition. And you can only petition within 10 days of the announcement of the results. And all evidence must be by affidavit. And the standard of proof is that you must show that not only were you cheated, but that the cheating was of a substantial manner. You must demonstrate all this in court. Uh, and, uh, but the point is, 
you know, even before the results came out, the loser imprisoned the winner. And, and. For 10 days. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. so, so the, you know, the thing is that in spite of all their propaganda, the intimidation, the violation of rights and so on, they still lose, they actually lose elections. In, in the last election, we demanded that we should have an audit. We should have, since the constitutional means was obliterated by their wrongful acts of arresting me, and we went to court and proved that I was illegally detained, we said, let's have an audit. Let's bring our results. You bring yours. Let's have international uh, supervision. Let's audit the results. They refused. When they charged me with treason, it was because I announced myself a winner. I went to court and told the court that it is true. I announced myself a winner. So let's, the, let's hear the case. And I show you that I was indeed truly the winner. The case has not been hard up to now, <laughs> from, from 2016. So you told us about, um, just to finish, you told us about a saying, in the home of the brave, they are crying. Um, I think it's fair to say that you have been quite brave over the last 20 years, that you have been contesting Mr. Museveni and standing up for uh, some sort of democracy in Uganda. What keeps you going through all the persecution that you've received uh, from that regime, um, and what has motivated you to carry on, even in sort of times of being imprisoned? Well, uh, I think part of it is what I talked about. The fact that at the beginning, I considered that I could have died. When I was in jail, first for having supported Mr. Museveni, who had gone to the bush, and I really nearly died. Mm. I was 24 years then, I was not married, I did not have children. Neither did I when I went to the war. Um, but I felt very strongly that people should not live in situations like those, mm. and that certainly those who come after me should have a better chance. But having so joined, you know, the, there is a huge burden of colleagues that have paid huge sacrifices. Some are maimed, they are in wheelchairs, you know, you meet them and they keep on saying, please, you know, why did we get into all this situation? Uh, keep on, you know, otherwise we, we, we suffered in vain would have suffered in vain. And you, f you feel the burden that, you know, uh, it's not just my own uh, sacrifices, but the sacrifices of so many, which are even more serious than mine, that would go down the drain if we gave up. But, um, you know, you know, this question, you know, of course comes up many times. Let me tell you, you know, I, I believe in God. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, there are many things that we sometimes do which we cannot really explain how or where we get the, the energy or stamina to continue doing and I've passed through some very, very bleak moments that certainly I cannot explain how I, I was able to really go through. So I think there is also some kind of uh, you know, forces that I am not able to explain, uh, but I believe there is also God's intervention in all this. Thank you very much for answering my questions. I think we have time for some questions from the audience. So if anyone has one, just raise your hand. Can we go to the lady in the fourth row? Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in your perspective, what do you think that a challenge to the given system would look like, given the fact that clearly the current regime isn't gonna budge and give in to the people's desires, but then any sort of uh, revolt or coup would create long-term instability. So 
what would the ideal situation be right now? Well, uh, a coup not only would it create instability, it would recreate the same system. It would still be the guns that are in charge. Uh, so the struggle we are talking about is a struggle of unarmed people uh, who organize to weaken those who are armed. And, um, and there are many ways in which it's done. It's, 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 a, it's a protracted kind of struggle. Let me tell you, you know, for some years now, there were soldiers deployed around my house full time to stop me from going out or if I go out to go with their uh, allow permission and follow me to see what I'm doing until I come back. But you know, because in doing all the kinds of things they do to protect the regime for the regime survival, they actually don't have resources for people's survival. And these soldiers are part of those people the, their relatives have no medical care, they have no education, they have no jobs, they have no, you know, it's the suffering permeates into the forces themselves. And so these fellows they bring to guard me, you know, would be there and from time to time I would come and talk to them because they have brought them to me there. And I, you know, ask them how they live. And they tell me, you know, we live terribly. And I say, so do you realize that uh, Actually, what we are doing is to fight for you. Say, yes, we actually know, but you know, orders are coming from above. You say, don't worry, you know, you just tell your friends that this is your struggle. <laughs> and, uh, and after, you know, and they stay there quite often without any food. Sometimes I would, you know, go and buy some ripe bananas and distribute to them, and, and they are very happy. And, uh, and uh, after a few days, they are taken back to their barracks. They, they take the words also, and, uh, Tell them, you know, this thing. And quite uh, clearly, you know, in, uh, you know, that I'm just talking about one incident, but many similar situations have led to the security forces themselves being some of our strongest supporters. In the last election where soldiers voted, we won convincingly. And, uh, and, and, uh, it has caused a lot of problems for the, for the regime. Now they are trying to recruit a new force and to do all kinds of things. So you, it's, it's a protracted struggle of weakening them while strengthening the population. And at some stage, the balance tilts. And when it tilts, the soldiers join the population. Quite often, they, you know, just like you saw what happened in Sudan, they arrested Bashir, their, 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 their master, and now charged him for killing the, <laughs> the protesters. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, there is still a lot of negotiation going on uh, because the soldiers also wanted to now be uh, the champions. But the people said, no, 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 wait a moment. This, we didn't fight for you. We want to be in charge of this thing. So, it's a process that leads to people eventually taking and taking power and subordinating the guns. What, that's why I say once it happens, it's irreversible because they know how to do it. Uh, if you, if you, whereas if there was a negotiated change of government, for example, a negotiation amongst the elites, which can happen also, the elite groups can have a dialogue and negotiate and one gets out and is given some comfort uh, somewhere and another group takes over. That group still will remain outside the control of the people and can reverse even the struggle that they had achieved. Uh, so ultimately it is the question of building the competencies within the population. This is how all these democratic societies that you have here developed, you know, uh, negotiating with the sovereign and so on, and building institutions, the Magna Carta, and so on, until uh, people uh, assert their will. 
can take the question in the front row. I'd like, just like to follow up on what you just said about um, the point of uh, strengthening the community and um, building democratization within the country. I was wondering how you felt about the role of the international community, how that could impact the process of democratization in your country. And also, like, I was for instance, thinking about how it was about five years ago or something where Uganda, um, someone from Uganda was president of the UN General Assembly, I think. Do, do you think approving of the legitimacy of the, of the current government is, is helpful, or how should the international community respond to your situation, and how could it be helpful, or should it be actively helpful at all? Yes, the international community can definitely be helpful, but quite often it isn't. In fact, quite often it's part of the problem, rather than part of the solution, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, because again, you know, the international community is a community of nations that have interests. <laughs> and quite often the interests of those nations, especially the powerful ones, are at variance. Quite often they are at variance with the interests of the weak uh, communities in our nations. Because those countries, at any rate, uh, are still interested in having an advantaged relationship uh, with these uh, with these countries, and and so uh, yes, to some extent, they can indeed be a problem, but certainly the international community has a huge potential to be supportive of democratization processes, uh, and uh, and that is. Um, because, you see, even as we struggle internally, it's a very difficult struggle because of all the levers being in the hands of the few. So the people are totally uh, deprived of resources. We talk about even these opposition parties, but even because of that situation of uh, terror in the country, nobody can write a check to an opposition group. It would be treason if, and they would, and there is a lot of, you know, there are spies everywhere and everybody is fearful. If you write a check, your business will be destroyed. You are, if you have a job, you'll be sacked if you have. So just to resources, to do the minimum things I'm talking about, you know, to maybe uh, have means of communication. As I have told you, means of communication are not easy. For example, some of the ways we use now to communicate, and happily, there is a lot of advantages from new media. Uh, we can get uh, memory cards, put our messages there, and circulate them in the villages because they can fit in these smallest phones, not the smartphones. They can go in any phone and uh, people will listen and can congregate there. So you, if, when they chase me from the radio, I can send a memory card and it becomes a radio in a, in a, in a village, or whatever. If you have a little more resources and you had maybe some smartphones around, you could actually do a lot. You can do online TV, you can do online, you know, you know, live broadcasts on Facebook and so on and so forth. But, you know, the minimum resources to achieve some of these competencies are not available. Or just to get some people to move from point A to point B. Uh, so, external people can be quite helpful in just providing small interventions that can make a hell lot of, uh, of a difference. Uh, but even more importantly, just insisting on rights. Because rights are universal, the UN has already a mandate to ensure that I have a freedom, a fr freedom to move freely in my country, that I should not be you know, uh, deprived of my work, that I should not be you know, just freedom. If the international community was able to put their foot down and say, respect the freedom, that would be enough. All the other things we would do, you know, if we can 
cause a meeting to happen. If we, in fact, just today I, I saw um, again leaders of uh, the party in which I come from, the party president, was obstructed from visiting a remote area in an island. Uh, and there were so many forces just to stop. <laughs> so just freedom, just insisting on freedom. All this the, the, the international community could do, but regrettably they don't. And that is because of all other interests, because in the United Nations, they want Uganda as a country to vote for them on this, on that, you know, <laughs> and they trade. That's how, in spite of all this, the foreign minister I talked about, whose briber has been convicted, was the president of the United Nations General Assembly uh, only two years ago. <laughs> so, and he became president of the United States, of the United Nations General Assembly, after he had been censured by the Ugandan parliament for corruption. Yes, he was nonetheless elected president, president of the United Nations. And, and sure enough, that's how he brought this briber. He comes from, he brought him from the United Nations. Uh, so uh, I don't think that the international community can be relied on to really offer the kind of support that, that struggles like ours uh, really do. Unless, of course, the dictatorship itself is very inept. Now, in our case, you must credit a person like General Museveni. He's very manipulative. He's alert, he's, you know, he's skilled in manipulation. He's not an Ida Amin uh, who will just, you know, bango and uh, create, it, make it easier for anybody to, uh, to intervene. Um, can we go to the hand in the front row? Um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Joel. I'm studying here. My question relates to the debt that Uganda has been engaging in. Um, the local media has been covering it really well, the sovereign debt we have with the Chinese government. And while the government has raised the argument that it's important for us to invest in infrastructure and do all of these things, um, do you think that that debt is manageable for us as a country? And what would you do different with you know, this ever accumulating debt that we're getting in as a nation? Thank you. Well, uh, regarding the Chinese dates, I actually wrote an, an opinion in, in our media about it, characterizing it as odious. And I think there is a well-known principle of odious debt, you know, where you give debt, even if it was to a legitimate entity, but well-knowing that the purpose for which this debt is being given is not likely to lead to the repayment. <laughs> uh, that debt uh, becomes odious. Now, in our situation, first of all, there is contested legitimacy of the, of the regime, and we make it very clear to them that it's contested. Uh, but secondly, you know, uh, earlier on when I was chatting with uh, colleagues outside this meeting, I told them about a road that has been built to connect the international airport at Entebbe and Kampala, which is, uh, you know, about 50 kilometers, that has cost $480 million. <laughs> it's the highest <laughs> cost per kilometer. Uh, of such an infrastructure in the world. And uh, you know, what it simply means is that these are slash funds that are taken uh, for all kinds of things that citizens then are encumbered with to pay. So it's not just the, 
dead stock. The dead stock may, in terms of figures, appear to be sustainable. Because again, people tend to use statistics, you know, we, it's this percentage of D GDP and therefore it's better than the other one, which is uh, 60, 70% of GDP. But if the 60% of GDP was prudently invested, whatever debt it is, and that it was invested in uh, uh, projects that are viable to recover uh, the money, that's not, that will not be a problem. But if whatever debt you take, if you have slash funds being taken away to, uh, you know, some havens in the, in the world, if you, the money that, the, the project itself is politically motivated, not economically justifiable, you know, that, uh, you know, it leads, we've had people tarmacking roads just lead to their, leading to their homes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and to be paid by everybody. Uh, so, that I think is the greatest challenge with our debt. That our debt is being contracted by, you know, some kind of mafia system. Uh, and a large part of it is not benefiting the people who will pay it. And uh, uh, on projects that can recoup it. That's what really makes our debt problematic. And uh, we have, as I have said, been loudly sounding, uh, you know, caution to those who are providing this money, especially uh, the Chinese government, that more prudence must be exercised uh, in, in, in giving out money of this kind. I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so much. Can everyone join me in thanking Dr. Kizabuzi? <laughs> <laughs>